We are really happy that you could join us today. As you already know, today's talk will be given by uh, Ashil Bataria from ETH and University Hospital Zurich. He will be talking about accessing multiomics data for the purpose of tumor profiling. So uh, we have a question and answer chat box on the right side of page. If you have any question during the webinar, please uh, write them into chat box uh, or question and answer chat box and uh, you can write them throughout the webinar. Now, uh, let's start. I'm uh, passing my virtual microphone to Ashil. Um, thanks, Julai. Uh, let me just quickly set up my, uh, share my screen. Okay, super. Can everyone see the slides? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, hi, everyone. Um, as Chu I said, I'm Ashul. I'll be talking to you today about um, how to access multiomics data for the purposes um, for tumor profiling specifically. As before I get into anything, I'll just give you a quick, uh, quick structure uh, about the talk today. Um, so, first, give you a quick um, introduction about what multiomics data consists of and why I think it's important that we take this approach, especially in the context of um, tumor biology. Then I move on to some of the resources, and I won't spend too much time on this, but that are available for uh, people to access multiomics data, um, whether it be large cohorts or smaller uh, data from smaller publications. And then uh, the majority of the talk will be focused on um, accessing data and using the data and the uh, structure of the data that you can obtain from the Cancer Genome Atlas. Um, and that's what majority of this talk will be about. Um, just to get a little understanding of what this consists of, because when I started my PhD, that was what I found um, uh, hardest uh, to get my head around all the data there is available. Uh, then if we have time at the end, I'll go over a case study um, of regarding, closely regarding some of my work um, um, about renal tumors and uh, renal cancers generally. Um, I assume most of the people here are biophysicians or in the field of biology of some sort. Um, and so you'll be aware that the most common biological data types are these five or six that you see here. And they consist of genomic, uh, epigenomic, transcriptomic, proteomic, and metabolomic data. And um, kind of reiterate the point uh, when we refer to omics and ohms as a, as a, as a term, what we're really considering is um, all the elements of a particular space. So if we take the transcriptome, for example, and we're measuring uh, microRNA expression, we're not just measuring the expression of one or two genes, but we're measuring the expression on the MRI level, at least, um, of all the genes. So inherently, this data is, um, is much larger than what you might be used to uh, when you're just looking at a couple of um, genes of interest. What traditionally we have done uh, when we consider a single omics data set um, is we try and find associations between that single omic um, data. So take, for example, copy number variations, and we associate aberrations that we see in a specific, uh, in a specific disease uh, with some kind of, um, into that disease against some kind of control. So whether it be normal tissue or between another disease, you're trying to distinguish the two between. So say, for example, you associate um, an amplification of chromosome four um, for a given disease um, versus your control group, you say, okay, so that is associated with my disease type. However, what that doesn't tell you is what the consequences of that uh, amplification is and what that actually means. So essentially what you're doing is finding associations, correlations, as opposed to uh, causative changes and the true etiology of the, of the disease you're looking at. And what we aim to do with multi-omics data um, is to use a, um, multiple layers, if not all of these layers, and you're acknowledging the fact that there is some dependency between them. So you have mutation, um, CNV and methylation, which all by express, uh, which have an effect on the transcriptomics, which would then have an effect on the proteomics, which again would then in turn have an effect on the metabolomics. And again, um, the relationship between these layers is far more complex than just the, this stepwise process. And you have much positive and feedback, positive and negative feedback between these layers. And what you're trying to do is capture that and assess how that um, does affect the function of the cell. So what a multi omics approach allows you to do is take a more a systems approach and a holistic view on a cell's functionality. And this allows you to identify causative changes 
um, in your um, of course the changes of the aberrations. For example, if you see an application of chromosome four and you have other data available, such as proteomics, you can see okay, so this gene is um, overexpressed in this protein level, and it also lies in chromosome four. So there may be some causative uh, relationship between the two. And what um, allows you, what you can also allows, what you can also do uh, when you take a systems approach, is you have a much larger uh, molecular space to identify um, targets for intervention, which will then reduce the effects of the aberration. So the consequence of the aberration, which then causes the disease. So you increase your space where you can intervene. And this is very important for uh, complex diseases, such as cancers, um, where you have um, a large degree of heterogeneity and uh, very complex etiologies where you have multiple drivers, for example. In more recent times, as, as it becomes cheaper and um, much easier to produce multi-omic data sets, you will be aware that in more and more papers and more and more labs are producing these types of data. Um, trying to find and identify, especially in the field of cancer, these causative relationships between these layers um, to really understand the etiology of these cancers and the relationships between these layers and how that um, results in the disease phenotype. Um, with all this data being available, um, it's very easy to kind of assume that you have to create this data from scratch, even though it's um, probably, most likely, already been produced. Uh, and so I'm just going to go quickly go over some of the resources that are available for you to access uh, multi-omics data. Um, and I'm just going to quickly touch on the largest ones that we have. And so, for example, we have the ICGC data portal, uh, which originates from the Ontario Institute of Cancer Research. Um, and this largely consists of um, huge cohorts, uh, huge cohort studies from around the world. So considering Asia, Europe, the Americas, um, this is where you find a lot of that data. Then you have the CE Bio Portal. Um, the CE Bio Portal is central or is, is um, made available by the Sloan Kettering Institute. And this contains both uh, large project, um, projects such as the Cancer Genome Atlas and Genie, but also smaller publications and smaller um, cohort sizes um, that people publish on a, on a more daily basis than these large um, hundreds of thousands of patient cohorts, which is similar to the European Genome Phenome Archive which again acts like a repository where you can um, submit your data or um, to make it publicly available for anyone once you publish a paper. And interestingly, um, the European Genome Phenome Archive also um, contains data from the TraceRx consortium, which was recently released from the UK, I think a couple of years ago. So that data is available there. And the GDC data portal, um, which largely supports all the initiatives present at the, cancer, uh, at the Center for Cancer Genomics uh, in the States. And um, they have there are quite a few large um, initiatives, such as Target currently, uh, which aims to identify therapeutic targets for given diseases. Uh, but this is also the main hub for the Cancer Genome Atlas data. And what you'll notice is that the Cancer Genome Atlas uh, data kind of, kind of features quite frequently uh, within these three data types, uh, in these three um, sorry, data portals. Um, and because it's, you know, by no chance, because it's by far one of the most uh, comprehensive um, uh, data sets um, with you know huge amounts of um, multi-omic data available for a large amount of patients. To go into that in a bit more detail, um, the Cancer Genome Atlas was first um, began in 2006, 2006 uh, between the National uh, Cancer Institute and the National Human um, Genome Research Institute in the States. And the first release of data, I think, was just two years later, uh, where they released genomic data for glioblastomas. Um, and what the TCGA consists of, and why I think it's such an, an amazing resource, um, especially for us statisticians, is that it consists of 33 different tumor types, 11,000 patients. And what makes it unique is that it has data uh, for seven different um, omic types um, for each of, these, uh, each of these patients, or the majority of these patients. So it contains mutation data, copy number variation, methylation, microRNA, mRNA, and protein um, expression for the majority of these patients as well as clinical information for, I think, all of them. And um, in some certain data sets, you have both um, tumor and match normals available. Um, and this kind of rich data set is very hard to come by, and I think it's quite unique. So the rest of this talk is going to be really focused around uh, the Cancer Genome Atlas data and uh, what is there and how to use it. And so initially, what you will find when you're um, looking at the Cancer Genome Atlas and using this data, there are four different levels. So there's level one, which is essentially just the raw data. 
and that's fairly self-explanatory. Then you have level two, which is intermediate level data, which is essentially um, just the samples that have individually been analyzed and uh, normalized. Um, but these two first levels are have a controlled access. So if you want access to the raw data, you have to apply um, via the GDC uh, in order to use this data. However, um, what the majority of people in the community use um, is the level three data. And this is also what I use. And this is so-called legacy data. So the legacy data um, is created using um, the human version, uh, the human genome version 19. And this comes in the form of aggregated, normalized, and segmented uh, data tables. And I'll go into um, some detail about um, the data types later on. And then uh, this is by far the most common, and this is what you will also find in level three data is what they have in the TCGA uh, publications that you find uh, online. And level four data is uh, a bit more recent. Um, this is so-called harmonized in the sense that uh, all the raw data developed from the cancer genome atlas was um, uh, placed through a single analysis pipeline um, using the newest version of the human genome. And this is what they use, um, or this is the data that they use in their pan-cancer analysis. So when they're comparing uh, or when they're considering all tumor types together, um, this is seen to be uh, most appropriate when comparing um, budget groups. And at any point um, in this talk, I'm usually referring to level three data. Um, and the examples I've, I give um, are all coming from um, a cohort of clear cell cell carcinomas from the TCGA, uh, which is what I use in my day to day work. So, um, to get into the crux of the matter, um, where do you access the data from? And, um, you know, why, 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 why the easiest way to access the data is via Firehose and the FireBrowse. Um, websites and the TCGA uh, biolinks um, R package. Um, I will say you can get the data from the resources that I mentioned earlier, but I personally use these two um, because they are, I find them by far the easiest to use um, and they just seem the more intuitive. In terms of a workflow, they're just easier to, to handle. So first off, we have Firehose and the FireBrowse um, uh, APIs. That's the FireBrowse API. Um, so basically, these are uh, these both stem from the Broad Institute in the States. And what Firehose does, so what basically what Fire Browse is, is a, um, a user interface where you can access all the data um, that the Broad Institute have analyzed uh, using uh, the TCGA uh, data sets. Um, so all of that is available, all the analysis pipelines and the results. And Firehose, or Firehose is essentially the analysis infrastructure um, which carries the TCGA samples through their analysis workflow and ensures that all the samples go through the same workflow and to get the uh, results at the end. And like I said, FireBrowse is the user interface where it's what you would interact with and in order to obtain not only the input files for all the workflows, but also the results from the um, all sorts of analysis that they have carried out. And I'll quickly show you some of that analysis um, in a second. Um, and the one important thing to note is that um, FireBrowse uh, web app only contains legacy data. So it only contains data using the human genome version 19. Um, there were plans, I think, to have a release for the newer um, human genome, but I think that's um, been made available yet. Um, so largely it's just um, legacy data, which is again, I think what you would um, most likely be using. And there are four main ways to access the FireBrowse data. This includes Firehose GET, uh, which is available on Linux and Unix machines. Um, and this is essential for, uh, essentially for bulk downloads. So if you want to have, uh, if you want to take um, entire cohorts and entire omic data sets for entire cohorts, um, this is what I would recommend using and that's what it's kind of designed for. If your needs are a bit more niche and you only want to look for specific uh, data sets and specific um, samples, uh, you can use the FireBrowse RESTful API. And that's an interactive web app. So you can do that via the website. Um, you can kind of browse and select the data that you want. And then it provides you with a URL from which you can download the data you've requested. Then you have fbget, which is basically a Python and Unix wrapper for the RESTful API. And it's much easier to use um, than the web app, I would say. And um, I'd highly recommend that if you're using um, some kind of command line um, tools and analysis pipelines. And then finally, you have FireBrowse R, which um, is basically just an R package that allows you to access the same information. So before I move on, I kind of wanted to show you a quick overview of what FireBrow actually looks like. Um, so if we do that really quickly. So if you land, so I don't know, can everyone see this? 
right? You see the Fire Browse website? Um, so here on Fire Browsers, we access, uh, was kind of a, uh, the access point for um, TCGA data that's been analyzed by the Ford Institute. So here on the right, you have all the different um, analysis pipelines that they've gone through. So the analysis data type, sorry, not the pipeline. Uh, that's available um, considering the entire uh, tumor cohorts that they have, all the 33 of them. And then here at the top, you can find your web API that I mentioned, the RESTful API. You can browse and search um, the data that you want to download, and it provides the URL. You can do that quite easily. And then you also have um, old runs. So if you have a run that um, you can no longer find or was previously um, carried out, you can always go back and find um, kind of like an archive of uh, previous results that they had, which you no longer be able to find directly through and the website now. Then you have these two um, search boxes here. So you have the view expression profile. So here, if you select uh, a given gene, for example, um, the bronchi lindau gene, it gives you the expression profile of that gene um, across all the different tumor types. And that's quite handy. And they have multiple tools here. And you can export this and look up these genes in um, different, base, um, different um, databases. But I don't want to spend too much time looking at this kind of stuff. Um, but I'll quickly mention this cohort um, analysis profiling. Here you add, uh, if you enter a particular disease um, tumor type of interest, so for example, PSL renal carcinomas, which is Kirk, what you see is all the analysis that they've carried out uh, for this tumor type. So if this loads, it takes some time. So this is basically a visualization of all the data that they have available on the FireBrowse um, website and the work that we did. Uh, so each column here represents the sample, um, and each um, row is essentially a different type of uh, genomic data or some kind of analysis that they've done. So here you can see the mutation rates of the different samples, you can see the mutational signatures, uh, the, the frequency of the gene mutations, and which genes they are, and in which patients they occur. Um, down here, they, they've kind of um, outputted some of the results of their analysis, so they've done some. Um, clustering using um, non-negative uh, non matrix factorizations and hierarchical clustering for um, expression and um, for mRNA expression and protein expression data. And you can download all of this data, which is quite cool. And um, uh, Ashil, we have a question. Yeah. Um, yeah, sure. Question is, it says data version 2016. Is this just the display or the actual data is version 2016? Yeah, so they don't. Um, so since so this is basically like an archive of the analysis they've done already. So because the TCGA data was um, is relatively old now, I suppose. Um, so they've already carried out these patterns. So they're not adjusting um, these results that you have here. So this is basically the latest version was from 2016, um, because that's just the pipelines that they use and that's the data that they have available. And um, like I said, there were um, there was um, an initiative to use the newest version of the human genome and release that. I think that is in the pipeline somewhere along the line. So that will be released soon, I think. But essentially, this is the data that they have, and the data, the raw data hasn't changed. So the analysis pipelines haven't changed, and it's been the same since um, um, three or four years ago now. Yeah. Um, so the, one of the good things about um, Firebrow's website is that um, not only can you access the raw data, so say here. We go to our cohort of interest, the clear summary of carcinomas. Um, this tells you the number of samples that they have for each data type. Um, and you can access the raw files if you just select a particular data type you're interested in. Um, I will go into detail about what these files are uh, later in the presentation. But right now, what I want to tell you about was the fact that FireBrowse not only allows you to access um, the raw data that it uses, so the, the normal TCGA data from these patients, uh, but also the analysis that they have carried out. So for the non-negative matrix factorization, for example, um, you can go down and actually um, download the results of the analysis pipelines, and you can use that downstream as well. Now that's something quite unique to Firebrowse, but that doesn't exist um, in TCGFI links or in the GDC data portal. So going back to our presentation, the next tool I wanted to talk to, to you about uh, were TCGFI links. And now this is, by far, um, what I would recommend you to use if you're going to be using R um, in any way, shape or form, when you're analyzing TCGA data, because um, this makes it far easier 
um, it, it downloads the data in a far easier and user-friendly manner than if you were to directly download the data from the FireBrowse website, um, as I did, because I was running in a hospital where you have IOs, et cetera. So if you have limited access to APIs, for example, you've got a restricted network, um, I'd recommend using um, direct downloads. Otherwise, uh, TCA BioLinks is perfectly fine if you just want to um, research the data um, outside of a restricted network. So uh, TCA BioLinks, um, as I said, works in R, and it directly um, connects to the GDC uh, data portal by its API. And as a result, you have, you have access to both the harmonized data and the legacy data. So the data that's um, aligned to both the newest version of the human genome and run through in the single analysis pipeline, as well as the legacy data, uh, which is used in the majority of cases. And uh, TGA BioLinks is fairly easy to use. And so you have three commands to uh, download and prepare the data. So the query, basically just um, you assign, actually I can show you this as well. So here you have your um, query. So this essentially um, tells you which cohort you want, the type of data you want, um, the kind of platform it was used uh, to generate the data. So for RNA sequencing, for example, and you have Illumina high seq data um, and the results. The results um, for expression data are the raw counts. We can also determine, you can also specify normalized counts, which give you the normalized results. So once you have your query, you download that query using GDC download, and then you prepare. And what GDC prepare does is basically reads it into R in a user-friendly in a user-friendly manner. Um, to get um, the um, appropriate um, labels for these fields, what you will need to do is access the TCGA uh, BioLinks Bioconductor help page, which basically outlines exactly um, the different uh, parameters you need to query the data. So you have the, the different data categories, so gene expression, a couple of the variations, you have protein expression as well, um, all sorts down here, gene methylation, for example. Um, then you also have your uh, data type, so gene quantification, isoform quantification, for example, your platforms and your file types. So these are all the data you'll need uh, to plug into here in order to download the data. And it's very simple. So once you get that, you end up with a, um, like a two by two table, this is just an example of gene expression. We have um, your rows as genes, your samples as columns, and then just um, raw counts for those genes for that type sample. Um, and another thing that's good about PTA BioLinks is that not only can you download the data, it also provides uh, commands for you to analyze and visualize the data. Uh, so for example, um, this command down here, um, allows uh, differential gene expression analysis uh, using edge R. But I would generally recommend you download uh, the data yourself um, using TGA BioLinks, but then you run the analysis um, yourself using the same tools or the tools that you're most interested in. That way you have more control over what the results you're actually getting are, you have more understanding of what you're producing. And then at the end, as a final step, it also has visualization tools where you can see and uh, visualize the data in two dimensions or whatever however you want, a volcano plus of all sorts. I provided a link to the um, GitHub page down here, and I recommend, if, again, if you're using R, to definitely use TCA by links to obtain this data. So now, once you have the data, um, understanding what it actually shows is one of the tricky parts, and this is what took me quite a while to do, is get a real grip of um, how the data was generated and what the data types or the data files I'm getting are actually showing. Um, and so here, what I want to do is kind of go over um, each omic data set and the kind of structure of the files you will get. Um, what I will say is that here I talk over the data that is available or the files that are available by a direct download from the FireBrowse um, web page as, well, uh, as the input files that they use, um, partly because it's um, the most comprehensive list of the, of the different data types you get for each omic data set. And I'll show you what I mean by that um, as we go on. Um, the first thing you'll notice when you're using this data is that uh, each sample has a barcode. And each barcode is, has this kind of composition where it consists of your project, your uh, tissue source site, your participant, your sample, your file, 
And this is basically just metadata about the patient or the sample that this um, that was used for the analysis of this particular omic um, analysis. And what you'll be most interested in is in the sample. So values between 0, 01 and 0, 09 are tumor samples. And values between 10 and 19 are uh, normal controls from the same patient. Um, if the participant is the same. And what this other information allows you to do is, for example, the center number, um, is if you find any kind of spurious results, uh, you can go back and check uh, whether there are some kind of batch effects or some kind of commonalities between these barcodes to really understand why is it that you're seeing the data that you're seeing when you're not when it's not really what you expect it to be. <clears throat> so the first thing you will kind of come across, and what is probably the most easiest thing to handle uh, from the cancer genome atlas data, is the mutation data. So these come in the form of mutation annotation files, and these are derived from uh, whole exome and genome sequencing uh, on the Lumina high seq machines. And this, um, for each sample, or sorry, not for each sample, it's actually aggregated uh, for all the samples in the cohort, um, you get uh, a Hugo symbol uh, for the uh, gene, you get the entrance ID, you get the center at which it was um, sequenced, and then you get more information about the actual variant itself. So what chromosome, the start and position end, um, the type of variant mutation it is, the variant type, and the tumor alleles versus the reference. And then you also get um, the tumor sample barcode, so in which patient was this, was this uh, mutation identified. Now that's relatively straightforward uh, to use and doesn't require any kind of complex uh, methods from being like that. And then we move on to copy number variation data, um, which is um, derived from SNP arrays, so that some tumor types also have low pass for genome sequencing calls for copy number variation, but that's quite rare. So largely it's derived from SNP arrays. And what you find uh, in Firebase especially, and this is what I mean by is the most comprehensive in the sense that um, in TCGA bilinks, um, you don't kind of get this kind of separation, this degree of uh, detail when you're trying to access the data. Although a lot of it's um, similar in the sense of what you would actually end up using. So here what you see is a separation between um, formalin fix and paraffin embedded um, samples in these four files. And then these four files are just um, all the samples um, that are together. And for each kind of pairing, um, you have alignments to um, an older version of the human genome, so 18, and the legacy uh, version of the human genome, so human genome 19. And um, you have both um, copy number variations with and without germline uh, aberrations um, taken into account. And what you find when you get copy number variation data here is they come in the form of segmented files. So segmented data is essentially uh, looks like this. You have your sample name, so this is your patient, um, and the sample that it comes from. You have your chromosome in which the aberration is seen. You have the start and end of the aberration. You have the number of probes um, that are assigned to the aberration, so the number of SMP probes um, that fall within this uh, region. And you have the segment mean, which is the representation of essentially the copy number of that, of that given region. Um, and the segment means are log two ratios of the copy number divided by two, uh, and copy numbers derived from the individual probes. So for example, a diploid, a normal diploid uh, region uh, would have a copy number of two, so you have a log two of what, a two over two, which is um, zero. So a value of zero would mean normal, uh, and any positive value means there's an amplification, any negative value means there's a deletion. If we now move on to the methylation data, <clears throat> This is made up of, um, or this is derived from a lin uh, Lumina Infinium Human Methylation 450, um, which essentially uses 450,000 probes across the genome um, to determine um, the methylation level across that, uh, for that particular sample. Um, and these files are much, much larger than any of the other data sets because you have multiple probes for um, each gene. Therefore, I would highly recommend you use something like TCGA BioLinks or the FireBrowse APIs in order to access this data, partly because the direct download is just, it just takes forever. Um, and it's just much uh, more practical in terms of formatting the data when you use one of those APIs. <clears throat> so what the uh, methylation data consists of um, is basically a two by two table of all the probes and all the samples and a beta value for each probe per sample. And a beta value is essentially the methylated, the, the methylated probe intensity versus the overall intensity at that particular site. 
And the um, Infinium assay uh, comes with three different types of um, probes. You have CG probes, which are um, binding to CPG loci uh, within your genome. And these are essentially your CPG islands and regions which uh, differential methylation affects um, expression largely of a particular gene. Then you have CH probes, which uh, lie on non-CPG loci. And then you have RS probes, uh, which are lie basically just, um, which are, sorry, um, they target SNPs. And these are essentially removable um, in terms of your analysis because they don't really contribute anything um, towards um, actual biological differences. They're largely used for tracking the samples. Um, then you also have a, a table that you get from T3 BioLinks, which um, assigns each probe to each gene, and that's done using the nearest transcription start site. Um, so, for example, this probe uh, has the closest transcription start site to RBL2. And the next thing you want you look at is um, the microRNA data, and this is by far um, one of the most complicated. Um, data sets you have in TCGA because there's so many different types of data available um, in terms of the microRNA that they derive uh, from these samples. So this all comes from Illumina HiSeq. Um, and there's a lot of redundancy, again, on FireBrows, these are the files on FireBrows. There's a lot of redundancy between these files, right? Um, but the first thing you'll need to notice is that you have RNA-seq and you have RNA-seq v2. So RNA-seq is the first initial version um, of the pipeline where they use um, RPKM values, um, which they're not the most reliable when you're comparing against um, different batches and different cohorts. So what they did in the second version was to use RSEM values. And RSEM is a package that they used for estimating gene expression and isoform expression uh, for RNA-seq data. And this is largely what uh, the majority of the community uses when assessing um, um, assessing uh, mRNA expression um, across these different tumor cohorts. Um, so I use two main files from these. Uh, this is the RCM gene normalized. So these genes are, uh, these are the expression values or the raw counts normalized to the 75th percentile with an 100, 100 I think 100 adjustment factor. And generally when you're using these um, files, you log to transform them just to reduce the skewness to make the values more comparable. And this is largely what most people use, especially when visualizing the data and um, trying to do any kind of analysis that doesn't require all counts. However, uh, what you're most likely to do when you have mRNA data is to carry out some kind of differential gene expression analysis. And in order to do that, so if you're using EDGER, for example, or DSeq, what you require are raw counts. And in the mRNA seq preprocess, um, you will have these raw counts available. Uh, from the fire browse, but in the TCGA biolinks, like I showed you in the quick example, um, when you just um, search for the results of mRNA seq, you get the raw counts themselves. And this is what you use for EDGER uh, to carry out um, differential gene expression analysis. Then, if we consider microRNAs, um, much like uh, mRNA data, and there's a lot of redundancy within the files that you're available in the fire browser. So, here again, you have a separation of formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue. Um, from all the samples. Then you have these two samples, which are derived from a Lumina Genome Analyzer. And then you have the top four files, which are uh, derived from Illumina HiSeq. And I always use uh, data derived from the Illumina HiSeq just because uh, that's more comfortable using. So if you prefer the Genome Analyzer, you can go ahead and use these. Um, again, like I mentioned, uh, there's a lot of redundancy. So all the data that you find in the mRNA seq preprocessed files will also be available in the gene expression files. This is the same information. However, this is just tabulated into one single um, file. Oops, sorry. As opposed to here, where you have individual for each one. Um, from these three data types or data files, I would rather use the isoform expression files, um, just because from this, you can derive the gene expression and the mature expression of your microRNAs, um, since the gene expression is just the sum of the different isoforms, and which is also similar to uh, deriving the mature um, expression is just the sum of the gene expression. Um, so I recommend using the isoform expression um, files when you're using uh, microRNA data from the TCGA. Um, the last omic data set I'll go over from the TCGA is the um, protein expression. Now, strictly speaking, um, this is actually derived from the cancer uh, protein atlas as opposed to the cancer genome atlas, um, but it occurs 
uh, but it's carried out on the same uh, set of samples. Um, so you have uh, so you have the uh, RPPA data um, for the sample, same samples they have your genomic information on. So RPPA is basically reverse phase protein arrays. They're essentially microarrays, but for proteins. Uh, so you have um, on a glass slide, you have spots corresponding to each of your samples, and then you uh, place an antibody out through that uh, across that um, slide, and then you measure the fluorescence of the antibody. Um, and strictly speaking, this is not really proteomic in the sense that you're not measuring um, the entire proteome of the uh, specific um, cell or the sample. What you're doing is uh, only using the antibodies that you can reliably rely on um, and assess um, the expression of the protein. Um, so these are a select few, so they're, I think, mostly just a few hundred in each genotype. And this, again, composed of level three and level four data, and this is all um, available on the MD Anderson Cancer Center website um, from the Cancer Proteome Atlas. And the level three data is normalized um, so that it's centered to the median, both across samples and um, for each gene. And the level four data, like the TCGA, um, is harmonized between uh, different uh, entire cohorts who can make um, pan cancer analysis. And the RPPA data um, is available both on the, the TCG BioLinks and FireBrowse um, websites and servers. And the final thing we want to talk to you about, about what's available in TCG is the clinical data. Now, in the clinical data, what you will find um, is that uh, from patients, so clinical data is gathered in XML format, which is hierarchical. However, when you're using tools um, in R, for example, you require two-dimensional tables. And so what the merged clinical um, files that you will find on the TCGA do is essentially convert the XML files into 2D tables. And therefore, you have um, hundreds and hundreds of clinical data elements or clinical factors for each patient, which may, may not all be relevant uh, to your given tumor type of interest. So what uh, the TCGA, TCGA did and what um, FireBrows is available is you have a select a uh, number of clinical properties um, chosen for each tumor type, um, and it's specific for each tumor type. And you have approximately 80 to 90, which you can then use uh, for clinical outcomes to determine whether your multi um analysis actually has any um, clinical bearings, so if it has any effect on survival, for example. And so what this data is kind of composed of is, um, well, the data you get is kind of looks like in this table. So you have your high reservation breath, which is basically your uh, samples, your patients, and then you have metadata or clinical data about these patients. So the age, their vital status, so if they're um, still alive or deaf. Um, then you have the tumor um, stages, and then you have your gender. And this data you can use, obviously, for survival and multivariate analysis and things like that. It's quite useful. Uh, so now that luckily we have time, um, what I kind of want to quickly go over is how I use some of this data in order to um, characterize renal tumors. Um, so my project specifically is about um, case of renal cell carcinomas, which I'll get into in a little bit second. Um, and what I really want to do here in this section is not really show you uh, all the data that I've developed or my story, essentially. Uh, but what I wanted to show you is how we can use this data derived from the TCGA um, in three different ways, um, one more progressively complex than the previous, in order to really uh, profile um, a specific tumor. I'll quickly give you a brief overview of uh, renal cell carcinomas. Um, these are made up of uh, three subgroups. You have clear cell renal cell carcinoma, you have papillary carcinoma, and then you have chromophobe renal cell carcinomas. And as you can see by the images, um, they have very distinct um, histological phenotypes. And so, the, and yeah, and they all have different etiologies in terms of uh, what causes these cancers. Um, so essentially what I'm really focusing on is the center uh, sensor point is the clear cell renal cell carcinomas and uh, specifically my project focuses on um, determining how a subset of these patients of, that have this cancer develop the cancer with that characteristic aberration which is this, which is this BHL inactivation um, and why they get the same cancer with the same phenotype. In order to do this I take um, what I call a bottom-up and top-down approach is what I refer to. So I, this is all using the cancer genome atlas data. So my bottom-up approach consists of individually analyzing each of these um, multi-omic data, oh, each of these single omic data sets um, on its own. And then I begin to um, integrate these data sets together. 
And in the end, ideally what we have is a detailed description of my tumors of interest. Um, and so what makes them kind of tick in a, a more of a systems approach. Then I have a top-down approach um, where we take, uh, where we ignore basically the uh, site of origin of these cancers, and we just focus on the molecular aberrations within these tumors. So you have copy number variations, mutations, transcription, methylation, all that data, you put them together um, and you do some clustering using all the different um, tumor types. And then ideally what you want to find is um, clusters in which your tumors reside, your tumors of interest, um, and then you extract features which define that cluster, which then not only tell you more information about um, the tumors that um, you're interested in, but also the neighboring tumors and the histological um, types these tumors are will give you more information about how these tumors are treated and how you can possibly treat um, your tumors of interest uh, that have the same molecular aberrations rather than just focusing on the site in which they um, arise. Um, so the most basic um, fundamental um, ways of kind of integrating two data sets is just to have um, some kind of correlation between the two. So if we have uh, methylation and expression, for example, um, we can, everyone knows that some methylation uh, differences in your genome will have an effect on the expression of a particular gene, especially if this promoter is hyper or hypermethylated. And so what I'm showing you here is on the x-axis uh, is the difference in mean pro beta values, the difference in methylation level between two groups. Let's call them A and B. So uh, in this quadrant or in this uh, right side of this axis, you have um, uh, probes which are um, highly um, methylated in um, group A versus group B. And down here you have uh, probes which are, have a decrease in methylation in group A versus group B. And uh, similarly in your uh, y-axis, we have uh, expression differences. So in the lower half, you have um, genes that are low expressed in group A versus group B. And um, in the top half, you have um, genes that are increased in expression in group A versus group B. And what I'm showing you here is um, the probes and the corresponding genes which are of which those probes are assigned to, which are both hypomethylated, so have a reduced um, methylation and an increase in expression but in A versus B, which is what you would expect and when looking at hypomethylation. So you have a lower methylation level, increases expression um, compared, when you're comparing two groups. Um, so that's in this quadrant. And if you look at uh, down here, um, what I'm highlighting are genes which have uh, hypermethylation, so an increase in methylation uh, in group A, but also a lower expression in uh, group A. That, and this basically tells you that this methylation level um, is actually having an effect on the expression of these genes, or there's some kind of association between uh, the methylation level and the expression of these genes. And the only ones, and the ones I've highlighted are just the ones that meet my uh, cutoffs in terms of Q value and uh, absolute differences. So that's one way and the simplest way you can kind of integrate two different types and find causative changes uh, between the two. If we get slightly more complicated than that, um, we can use something um, called Netics. Um, this was developed by Christos, who used to work in uh, the lab I'm associated with here in ETH. Um, and he um, called this network-based integration by a multi-omics data for parameters in cancer genes. Quite a mouthful. But basically, um, what uh, Netics aims to do is identify uh, mediated genes. So these are the genes in green, um, using both the aberrations that you see and the differential gene expressions that you measure. So what Netics does is using uh, provided a, a interaction network and some form of um, network diffusion, you provide it with a list of uh, aberrations. So it can be differentially expressed microRNAs, um, differently expressed methyla uh, differentially methylated genes. Uh, genetically aberrated genes, so either genes with mutations and copy number variation aberration. And then you provide that along with a list of uh, differentially expressed genes. And when you run that through Netics, it provides you a, with a ranked list um, of genes it considers to be mediated. So these are genes that link the genetic aberrations or the microRNA aberrations that you see in your samples um, to give you uh, the differential gene expression that you're measuring um, when you're doing mRNA seq, for example. So here you can combine multiple data types. So here you can combine microRNA, mRNA, uh, a mutation, copy number variation data, uh, differential gene expression, even differential protein expression. And you can all combine that into this one uh, tool. 
And as an example, I ran this using uh, KSL renal cell carcinomas uh, against normal samples. And what you find uh, is a list of mediators. And one of the top mediators in this cohort uh, is HIF1 alpha. And that's been traditionally well known to be contributing quite heavily uh, to the tumor genesis and central to the tumor genesis of renal cell tumors. And here where you see um, the colors and the labels are not really important in terms of what they mean. But what you need to be aware of is that the identified mediator by Netics has some merit in terms of um, the amount of interaction and the amount of effect it has um, in terms of its downstream and upstream um, connections within the network and the cancer related network I'm given. So for example, this is very much a mediator and central to causing the different aberrations that you see in your samples, which are these colors, so a differential gene expression or mutation or some kind of aberration, uh, and essential to cause those changes and the central all that information travels through that one node and it's considered a mediator. Um, if we get continuously more um, complex than that, we can um, carry out kind of unsupervised clustering um, using these multi-omic data sets um, together. So here I'm using something called cancer integration by multi learning, which is derived, um, well, actually, it's, it actually comes from um, Ramazotti et al. in 2018 and which he actually used uh, TCG data to develop this in the first place. Um, so the idea is that you can combine uh, point mutation, copy number variation, promoter methylation and expression data um, together in order to generate a similarity matrix between your samples, uh, which then gives you an idea of um, the groupings within this, um, uh, in the samples that you've given it, um, from which you can carry out clustering and do some feature extraction and spiral analysis to identify um, what features that these different clusters have um, and what um, data types are used to, uh, to, to distinguish these different um, clusters. This is what I use on um, my pan cancer data set right now and is ideally touching upon my top down approach where I want to kind of apply this to um, all cancer types. Um, so, in order to do this successfully, you have to um, format the data appropriately. Um, so for the expression data, I used um, Z values, so Z scores for each gene, for each sample. For mutation data, um, I use just uh, missense or point mutation, so missense, one sense, five sites, uh, mutations, in-frame deletions, frame shift insertions and deletions. Uh, for the methylation data, I just use the uh, medium beta value for all the probes for a given gene. Uh, so for gene X, you have five probes. I use the median value of those five probes as a methylation level for that particular gene in that particular sample. Uh, the copy number variation data was slightly more complex to handle. Um, so for each segment that you have in that segment file, um, you have to assign all the genes that belong into that segment. And then I assign the segment um, mean as the value of the aberration of that gene in terms of CMB data. Uh, so this is the cancer genome atlas that I use. You have 455 samples on a pan -can kidney cancer setting encompassing 18,000 genes. So when I do this for um, kidney tumors, um, what you see is um, three distinct um, clusters. And this is very much quite provisional. So I haven't done any kind of refinement of beyond the what I've just shown you so far in terms of um, normalizing the data. But what you see is quite nice separation between three different clusters. So you have cluster three, uh, which is this blue one over here, which has the um, best survival. Um, and I did this using the clinical data uh, of these patients. Uh, you have cluster one, which has a, a medium survival, which is largely these, these green ones over here. And you have uh, cluster two, which is these red ones, has a poorer survival down here. And if you overlay uh, the tumor types, um, three different subgroups that we have for renal tumors, we see that they fit quite nicely into these three groups. Obviously, there is some overlap. But um, cluster one is largely made up of clear cell renal cell carcinomas. Cluster two is largely made up of papillary renal cell carcinomas. And cluster three is largely made up of uh, kidney chromophore carcinomas. Um, and what you will also notice is that this also lies um, quite nicely with the realistic survival rates of these three um, tumor types. Um, oh, this is just uh, separating type uh, one and type two uh, papillary, papillary uh, renal cell carcinomas because type one has been shown to be um, shown to have a better survival than type two. And that's again where you kind of is reflected in the survival analysis and this clustering. 
Um, so in conclusion, what I wanted to kind of get across to you today was that uh, multi-omics analysis is essential for the understanding of complex diseases. And this is especially true for cancers, where you have a lot of intra and inter and intra tumor heterogeneity, and you have um, very complex etiologies for these diseases. Uh, I also recommend you be very aware when you're using any kind of data that's been generated somewhere else, that you take some time to really be aware of how it was generated and what it truly represents, um, because that will only help you understand the results you're getting at the end of it uh, far more easily. Um, and it's worth taking the time, even though it may be seem tedious, to really understand what this uh, these data is representing. Um, next, I want to kind of become aware of the fact that the cancer genome atlas provides a very unique data set uh, with an incredibly large depth and, and breadth in terms of the data that is available for the same samples, which is kind of unmatched anywhere else. So you have these other large consortiums which do a lot of mutation analysis or genomic analysis alone, but TCGA is the only one where you have so much data, so much different types of data for such a large number of patients. And lastly, I want to kind of touch upon uh, single cell data and single cell multiomics data. Um, that's rarer, but it is, of course, available. Um, largely, you get both genomic and transcriptomic data available for single cells, and that's readily available, for example, on the sequence read archive. You'll have loads of publications which have both uh, GNT and omic data available for single cells for given tumor types. And lastly, I wanted to kind of go over some useful links that I found useful when I first began my PhD, um, just to get some more information about these different tools that I mentioned, how they work, what they actually have, and what the data that it is that they show. Um, these are just some of the references um, of where I got some of this data and some of the information, some of the tools that I use. Um, if you're interested in any of these, um, I re definitely recommend reading the papers because it gives you real insight into how um, these things work. Lastly, I just want to say thank you to the uh, ISCB and the ISG from Turkey for having me to give this webinar. And I'd like to thank my wonderful lab and uh, Chulai for inviting me to give this talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ashil, for your talk. It was really informative and helpful. Uh, we can now get more questions. Um, if you have any questions, please uh, write them into the chat box. Uh, meanwhile, I can ask something from your uh, 22 uh, slide. Say that again, Shulai. Um, I have a question from your uh, slide 22. Oh, sorry. Stop sharing my screen. Let me go back. Uh, one second. Yeah, would you, would you uh, mind explaining again uh, why you prefer isoform expression instead of gene expression for uh, microRNA data? Right. Um, so the reason I prefer the isoform one is just because you can you can also as as a base file that I use is because you can derive the gene expression um, from the isoform expression. So the the values in the gene expression um, in terms of the counts are just the sum of the isoform expressions um, of, that, of that particular gene. Mm -hmm. So if the gene had three isoforms, in the isoform, you can just sum those three isoforms and you get the gene expression, which is the same value in that file. I see. OK. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, two more questions. One of them is, that are there uh, any multiomic database or tool which considers high c or ATAC sec data? Um, so a taxi data, I think, is available on the, I think, on the sequence read archives and the European Phenome Genome Archives. They have a taxi data. Uh, I'm not sure what high C data is, um, but uh, I know a taxi peak. I'm pretty sure is available yeah, on one of those two platforms. Uh, the other question is that do RPPA and expression have any correlation? 
Uh, so like mRNA expression and or um, I think so. Uh, can you write Jankut? Uh, is it mRNA expression? Uh, I can ask meanwhile the other question, which is, did you have a batch effect issue when you performed your analysis? Um, so some of the analysis, most of the analysis that I've been doing has been focused on, um, today has been focused on a single tumor type. Um, so I don't see that much, um, I don't see that much, uh, that much of a batch effect. Um, but when I, when I aim to consider the, the different types of tumor sites, like you saw in that clustering, um, slide, I think there are batch effects there. Um, and so if you're, I would recommend if you're trying to um, compare against uh, multiple uh, cohorts, so different tumor types, um, I would recommend um, using uh, the harmonized sets. I think they're more, um, they're more kind of uh, tailored to that kind of analysis rather than um, just a single omic analysis. Because I think when you take a, a single data set that's already kind of been much corrected in some in some shape or form. Um, so there may be slight differences, but I think uh, in the majority of the cases, I think I, I, was, I was okay with it. Um, yeah, when I was doing like my single omic assessment, I didn't see any major batch effects there. Uh, in terms of your mRNA and protein expression, um, so, right, so that's always kind of a standing question of whether um, the mRNA actually has um, a, a stronger association with protein expression, and that again has uh, much to do with the biology of your of your system, right? So um, some genes you have great correlation between the amount of mRNA and protein, um, but you can also um, find um, diseases or, or genes where you have increased uh, mRNA expression, but you don't have so much protein expression, and that's as a result um, either of just how the the data has been produced, but more likely as a result of um, the, the functionality of the cells and how um, it goes about producing or um, translating mRNA. Um, but in terms of TCGA, I think it has um, some issues when it comes to, um, yeah, like correlating the mRNA and the protein expression, but I think um, it's not, a, a, I mean, it, I think it's just specific to your kind of gene, essentially. Um, but yeah, I think it was all very dependent on your disease of interest. In terms of whether the level of mRNA has a correlation with the, the amount of protein expression. Okay, we have one more question. Um, can these multiomic approaches be integrated transcription factor gene interaction to construct some kind of gene regulatory network? Um, so when you say um, these multi these approaches, I mean none of the three that I showed you can do that, but there are tools that you know that allow you to do this. So um, if I'm right in thinking, you want to integrate uh, your transcription factors. Right, yeah, so you can do that, yeah, for sure. Um, so with this data, you can do that as well, but you just need, but the thing is you don't have, um, what you don't have is the actual transcription factor um, kind of binding sites given like these tumors, but then you have to get that from somewhere else. Um, but what, yeah, you can derive some kind of regulatory network that, um, uses this data in the sense that uh, you can look at the expression profiles of say proteins and mRNAs and then see how um, given specific uh, transcription factors um, and where they bind and if those regions are more or less upregulated in the genome uh, or sorry more or less upregulated you know, in terms of their binding uh, and their expression protein expression and then you can kind of create those networks for sure if you have a particular transcription factor that's as an increase in protein expression, um, you can associate that and link that back to um, the mRNA expression of those, of those type of genes for sure. Yeah, and I think that's also been done. I think fine. Oh, I won't talk about it now. I think that's stuff like that already exists. Yes. Okay. Um... It looks like no question left. So I would like to thank again, Ashil, for your uh, contribution to our project. And thank you everyone for being here today. 
uh, if you would like to be informed about our next events, uh, please uh, follow us on social media. We are on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. So have a nice week. Uh, also, if you have any questions, you can always yeah contact me as well um, about TCA data or have any questions other than that. Cool.